Don't you know Get down on my knees for you If you'd only ask me to I love you so Don't you know Can't you see You and I were meant to be Darling, take a look at me Doesn't it show, don't you know Can it be You don't care a thing for me I'm the only one who doesn't see Darling, don't play tricks on me Can't you tell I've fallen underneath your spell And you thought you knew me well Baby, don't go Don't you know Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to ACC's Big Day of Caring. My name is Danny Lee, and I am the program manager for the Lifelong Learning and Wellness Program at ACC. First, we must thank George Connor for opening our program with that beautiful rendition of Don't You Know. And he's a part of the Asian pair, so you might recognize him. And we're just missing our friend Mary Nakamura here. But um, that was the very first concert that I ever actually got to see here at ACC. So I'm so happy to see George here again. George is actually an arborist by trade, but at ACC, he is a compassionate musician who often comes by and shares his music with our senior community. And so we're so lucky to have him here today. George will play again later in today's program. So I wanted to thank you for being here today, George. So today's program, the big day of caring, we are live streaming and presenting a wide range of topics related to the caregiving experience. This includes everything from dementia care, how to declutter, and also how to sell your home. Our speakers are going to be including different staff members and also some outside experts who have presented at ACC on numerous occasions, so some of you might know them. Today's event also draws attention to ACC's Big Day of Giving, and we're having big days of giving on May 4th and May 5th also live stream. So we definitely encourage all of you and our other viewers to make a financial gift to support all of the amazing things that ACC does here. And we'll definitely get to that later in the program, so don't you worry. ACC is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year on top of the big day of giving. So suffice to say, we continue to provide much needed services to older adults and their family caregivers. And so it just earns us numerous awards and the moniker, a community of caring for ACC. Now, on to our first presenter. We have Mr. David <coughs> Truxel here. And David is an internationally known expert in Alzheimer's disease and memory care. He has worked for over 25 years in the Alzheimer's care field, developing and teaching care techniques as a consultant, writer, and speaker. He is also the co-author of the book, The Best Friends Approach to Dementia Care. And so without further ado, I would like to welcome David Trexel. Come on down. Thank you very much, Danny. It's great to be with you all. Um, I'm a big fan and supporter of ACC, and I look forward to writing a check in another week or two when you have the big day of giving. So I promise, yes, a first pledge. Uh, but it's great to be here. Uh, I'm in great admiration of all the work you do for our community and the long, rich history and legacy of ACC. So again, it's a pleasure to be here. 
Uh, I'm kicking us off by talking a bit about what's new with Alzheimer's disease and caregiving and really how to lift the person with dementia up. So we'll jump right in if I can have my first slide and uh, look forward to uh, presenting with uh, this very distinguished group. So my talk today is called Bringing Out the Best in Persons with Alzheimer's Disease or Other Dementia and, and a particular focus on communication and this best friends model of care that I've developed with my dear friend and colleague Virginia Bell. I'm very proud that at Maple Tree Village, they've embraced the best friends approach. Uh, they understand that in so many ways, the treatment for dementia is love and affection, communication, rich, rich activities, and uh, it's, delight, it's a delight to be here. So with that, we'll go on to our next slide. I think you all have um, seen or heard my introduction, but I am a writer. I live in Sacramento, California, but I've, I've traveled all over the world. I'm very proud, again, with my colleague Virginia Bell to have written a series of books on the best friends approach to Alzheimer's care. Uh, I think that's enough about me. We'll get onto the important topics here. So putting our conversation today in context, I was very taken by a cover, a magazine cover. Some of you may know Barron's Magazine. It's a weekly publication of Dow Jones that comes out kind of in a tabloid format, all about the stock market and investments. And in February of 2021, they had a very interesting headline talking about the other pandemic. And, and they, they basically made the case that Alzheimer's disease is the other pandemic. And so when we look at our numbers, I have to say they are very discouraging. Uh, Alzheimer's disease and these other dementias are the only one of the top 10 diseases that we don't have an effective treatment for. Even though there's some wonderful research going on about lifestyle and prevention, we don't know how to prevent dementia. And it's enormously costly. Uh, there are estimates that it's about $300 billion a year. And because our population is getting older and more and more people will develop dementia, it's staggering to think that it could even hit a trillion dollars a year if we don't get a better answer for this disease. A number of very reputable sources, including the American Public Health Association, have said that Alzheimer's and these other dementias may in fact be the most expensive illness in the US, maybe second these days to COVID. But this is an enormous public health problem. And again, uh, my friendship with your, a number of your board members, Derek, who've had this huge commitment to dementia care, I, I'm so pleased that you're taking care of, of your wonderful families and, and residents with a progressive view of, of dementia care. So I always like to talk a bit about history, and I wanted to show you a couple of slides to kind of kick off the day here in my presentation. Here is Dr. Alzheimer. He's the one who kind of started this whole thing off about 100 years ago in Germany. He was apparently a beloved figure, a very well-regarded pathologist doctor, and he was very fascinated by what they would have called back then lunacy. Lunacy. What causes this sort of aberrant behavior, this unusual behavior? Is it something in the water? Is it something in the air? Is it, is it witchcraft? My goodness, who, who knows what they would have thought 100 years ago. Dr. Alzheimer, though, was a progressive man, and he was a progressive thinker, and he thought there was a link between the brain and the body that must be causing some of this, what, they, what we now call dementia. And of course, we know now that he was correct. He was doing his work, and I, I, I do love history, and I'm kind of embarrassed and even a little bit ashamed to not have known a bit more of the history of this era. Uh, and only it was a year or two ago when I realized that there was a very fascinating collaborator with Dr. Alzheimer, a man named Dr. Solomon Carter Fuller, who was actually an American. In fact, he was the first ever African-American psychiatrist in the whole country. I'm not really sure quite how he connected with the German colleagues, the German lab. I know that certainly uh, in, in Europe at that time, it was really almost the birthplace of psychiatry. And, and he ended up being a key collaborator of Dr. Alzheimer, someone who hasn't actually been recognized much in the past. So I wanted to do a little shout out for Dr. Fuller. And uh, hopefully I'll, I'll learn more about this very distinguished man. Now, as we think again about Dr. Alzheimer's work, you know, how did this all kind of begin to come together? Well, here, in fact, is the patient uh, who is certainly not the first person who ever had Alzheimer's, but I would say she's the first woman or first person ever described as having Alzheimer's. And what happened is one day this man walks into Dr. Alzheimer's office with his wife, you know, to see the physician. And he tells Dr. Alzheimer this puzzling story that my wife seems to be getting forgetful. She is not, not able to do familiar tasks. She's having trouble uh, you know, following recipes, overflowing the bathtub, getting lost in familiar neighborhoods. And, and Dr. Alzheimer evaluated her. He realized that something was going on. She was only 51. And of course, if you take a close look at her face, uh, she looks like a much older person. And it's a sad face. It's a face with this loss and disconnection and loneliness. 
a Dr. Alzheimer studied her, and when she died, they did an autopsy of her brain. They found these things called plaques and tangles, these markers of the, in effect, the dead brain cells that shouldn't be there in a healthy brain. And they wrote an article about it. And in, in science, you discover something, they, they name it after you. So it, it's really something to look at her face. And, and I just want to put it out there that, you know, this is a face of Alzheimer's disease even today. This, again, this loss and loneliness, this sadness. But I think with companies and organizations like ACC, with progressive thinking about the disease, with good health care, by creating this therapeutic healing environment that I know we have at Maple Tree Village, I would argue that this doesn't have to be the face of dementia, that there's a lot we can do to, to lift this person up. One of the things that we could spend an hour on, I promise I won't today, but I think this is a very fascinating uh, handout that you can download from the Alzheimer's Association website. In fact, I've been told informally, or I guess maybe a little bit off the record, that this might even be the number one most downloaded handout of the Alzheimer's Association website. And it describes the 10 warning signs of dementia. And I like to show this slide because we, we so associate dementia with memory loss. That certainly is a factor. And, and you can see it's number one in this list, memory loss that disrupts daily life. But I just want you to understand the sort of rich tapestry of dementia that it also includes challenges in solving problems. So if you're a family member, you know, caring for someone at home, just remember if you're trying to get, for example, someone to come to a day program or get some in-home help, you can't be overly cognitive. You can't just explain and argue and rationalize. The person with dementia can no longer follow that, that string of the argument. Uh, again, confusion with time and place, uh, problems with visual images and spatial relationships. Sometimes you'll see a person with dementia pick up a fork and they'll, they'll even miss their mouth. Uh, one of the things to be aware of if you are at home caring for someone is do, do your best to unclutter the house. Make sure there's good lighting. Again, they can see a shadow and, and step over the shadow and fall. People with dementia are definitely at greater risk for falling down. New problems with words and speaking or writing, misplacing things and losing the ability to retrace your steps. Well, as someone who travels a lot, particularly before the pandemic, you know, I might get home and say, oh gosh, where's my charger cord for my laptop or where's this? I can almost always think and say, oh gosh, I must have left it at the podium and I'll call somebody and they can send it back to me. It doesn't happen too often, but it does occasionally. You see, I can retrace my steps. That's a sign of healthy memory, but somebody with dementia cannot. Decreased or poor judgment. Number eight is so important, and I know some of the leadership of ACC are very concerned about this, but people who are getting demented, they make poor decisions. You know, their judgment isn't quite clear. I was just reading today about uh, a scam where people will often try to get someone who's uh, a frail elder to buy gift cards and send them to them. They say, you know, there's been a mistake in your account and go to, go to Walmart or go to Best Buy and buy these gift cards. So be aware that if you're a family member, keep your, your alert going for your families with dementia because the thing is that they can make poor decisions, uh, they get those bogus IRS phone calls, and, and they can do things that you're, you'd be very surprised by. So poor judgment is something to be aware of and be careful to not you know, get these financial scams, uh, you know, keep them at, at arm's length. Uh, withdrawal from work and social activities, people have always been very active, uh, suddenly stopped doing the things they've always enjoyed, and changes in mood and personality. So just a few flavors of some of the things related to dementia. Uh, so what is this best friends philosophy? And this is sort of where I want to transition to talking about how we help the person living with dementia live their best life. Well, it's a philosophy of care I developed with my dear friend and writing partner, Virginia Bell, starting in the 1980s at the University of Kentucky Alzheimer's Center. We've written a series of books on this topic. Virginia, by the way, will soon be 100 years old, June 30th, and she's still working with me, working on a new book, and still very, very active. And again, this idea that, that when a person has dementia, they have so many losses, that they, they have frustration, they have anger sometimes, they, they don't always know where they are. It must be a frightening world. What can help them? Well, there's really no medicine out there that can do the job right now. The medicines are very modest. I think it's all about creating this sort of therapeutic, ther therapeutic, pardon me, therapeutic social environment. And so again, the medical model is there to support good health. When someone has dementia, we want to always be aware watch for depression, watch for pain, uh, keep their blood sugar under control, keep them as healthy as possible, treat anything we can treat. 
And in fact, uh, Dr. Mike McLeod from UC Davis, a now I think retired geriatrician, he often says dementia doesn't travel alone. So we want to always be aware of their health status. The Alzheimer's Association even has a phrase they've used in the past, what's good for the heart is good for the head. So again, keep them healthy. But ultimately, the medical model can only take you so far. So that's why this social model is so important. I like to say the brain loves company. The brain loves company. And that's why you'll hear me uh, again endorse the idea of using day centers, have a lively in-home worker, or even the power of assisted living and memory care can be quite profound. So, so what is our treatment today for Alzheimer's disease and dementia? I think you might be surprised by this slide to see that again, in so many ways, it's about this idea of activity. So I like to propose that whether you're a home-based caregiver, whether you're working in assisted living, whether you're part of ACC, that a number of these things include creative activities. Uh, you know, often you'll see bingo, of course, and trivia. Everyone loves those. I, I'm never going to attack bingo. Uh, but you can do so much more. You know, there are organizations that will adopt local animal shelter and make dog biscuits for them. They'll, they'll prepare packets of, of, of clothing and, and supplies for homeless people. Um, these kinds of things help the person with dementia feel needed. Creative activity, I'm a fan of collage because it's sort of text, you know, you have textures and you can paint and draw. And, and you know, we have so many amazing people working in the field of dementia in California. California, by the way, is a worldwide leader in dementia care research. So for example, at University of California, San Francisco, Dr. Bruce Miller and his team, they've actually studied artists who get Alzheimer's and keep painting and people who've never done art uh, get Alzheimer's and, and pain for the first time. And particularly people with frontal temporal dementia seem to have a spike in creativity. So, so embrace the arts, embrace the arts, uh, collage and painting and look at museums uh, virtually or go visit the Crocker. These are all things that I think we wanna do with people with dementia to live life. Uh, chores, I, I think you know, help, having mom help you fold the clothes or you know, stir something in, in, in the bowl or, or dust or clean, these are all great things because we all have a need to be needed. I, I was out to dinner a, a few weeks ago with several friends at their home and they served this beautiful dinner and what did I offer to do afterwards? I said, hey, can I help with the dishes? Now they turned me down, but this is the kind of thing we do in polite society and it's also something we do to sort of show appreciation. So even at Maple Tree Village, I'm sure there are residents there who help sweep and dust and organize and that helps them feel purposeful. Uh, spirituality, I, I think it's very important to know someone's religious and spiritual background. Sometimes those old rituals, maybe even with rosary beads, things like that can be very impactful. Life story work, you want to know a lot about the person. Maybe somebody even living in assisted living and memory care loves hot and spicy food. I want the staff to know that so we can offer them their hot sauce or Tabasco sauce. So again, life story work is all part of this therapeutic day. Music, it turns out that song lyrics and music actually live in a different part of the brain than words and language. I'm sure you've noticed that your family member often remembers these old song lyrics. So, you know, get one of those smart speakers at Google or Alexa. You'll be able to walk in their room and say, you know, hey, Google, play Frank Sinatra or, you know, play Dolly Parton or play opera. And this again can be, be very therapeutic. One family I know said that when they put on uh, Nat King Cole and, and, and jazz and music, it relaxes the father. And he's really much more willing to jump in the shower and kind of get the personal care done. So again, all of these things, exercise, uh, it turns out that exercise is probably number one on the list that might help us all delay the onset of Alzheimer's. People who exercise regularly may get Alzheimer's disease later in life than people who don't. And if you have Alzheimer's disease, and you're staying active, it might slow it down. So these are all things I recommend to you. Finally, being outdoors. When you're outside on a beautiful day, you get natural vitamin D, it's sensory, it's spiritual. So, you know, put on a straw hat, sit outside. These are all things that I think are very much recommended for dementia. So this best friends philosophy, uh, as we kind of begin to think about, you know, how you interact with your family member with dementia, I, I think a lot of it is empathy and understanding. You know, if I have, lunch with a friend and he tells me that he has a migraine coming on and maybe during lunch he's a bit snippy at me or kind of a bit irritable i'm not going to get into a huff about it and storm off I'll, I'll i'll have empathy i say oh gosh he has he has a migraine coming on i can kind of understand why he's being a bit abrupt with me and i can be forgiving so i think again with dementia you want to kind of walk a mile in their shoes and recognize that when there is behavior or challenges or someone's refusing to do something 
remember this public health concept, it's the disease, not the person. You know, if I had a broken arm, you could see it, and you know maybe I can't play tennis with you or golf today, but when you have a broken brain, you, you can't see it. So I think as a family member, adjust your expectations and, and recognize this disease is very real. Friends are, are warm and they show affection, and that's, I think it's very powerful with people with dementia. We know each other's life story. I, I know what friends I could throw a surprise party for, and I know which friends would never speak to me again if I threw them a surprise party, right? So again, we wanna know a lot about the person. My late mother, Dorothy, who passed away in 2008 with Alzheimer's, she was Canadian. She loved Earl Grey tea with milk. It was a long held ritual and we offered that to her. It was very, very successful. So again, if you have a friend, you're empathetic, you're understanding, you're affectionate, you know their life story, you communicate. Today, friends, you know, text each other, they email, they phone. I mean, there's a million ways. And so we know that communication is very important. I'll talk about that in a minute. Activity, engagement, and, and something I write about in my book, something called the knack, K-N-A-C-K. The knack is the art of doing difficult things with ease or clever tricks and strategies, clever strategies, having that knack of good care. You know, if mother says, President Eisenhower is doing a great job, you say, mom, I like Ike too, not what's wrong with you, he, he's dead. Uh, having flexibility. Uh, maybe you bring uh, someone their tuna melt that they ordered in memory care and they say, I didn't order that, take it away. Well, instead of arguing and saying, now, Bob, yes, you did, you ordered it. Look, I have it written down right here. You say, oh gosh, I'm sorry, Bob, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you something else. Or maybe you just come back 10 minutes later with a tuna melt and they, they'll say, fine then. So again, this idea of knack of flexibility is all something I think we can learn and can help us be more effective caregivers. Communication. I wanted to just share a couple quick tips of, of things for those of you who are family members or professionals listening to this uh, program from ACC today. Uh, some very basic things, learn not to argue or correct. Now, this is so hard. I mean, sometimes, you know, couples have maybe had kind of a combative relationship or combative moments. But, you know, when someone has dementia, is it really important to win an argument to prove that, you know, they're wrong and you're right? So, so I think it's okay to gently cue someone, you know, again, with my example earlier, if someone talks about President Clinton or President Obama, I think you can cue them the first time and say, you know, mom, we have a new president, this man named Joe Biden, let me tell you about him. But if someone's stuck on something, let it go, don't go with it, go, don't argue all the time. Uh, give lots of compliments. Uh, this is something I do a lot in staff training. And I wish, in fact, as a society, we did this more. But you know, when you're working with your mother or working with someone with memory loss, mom, I've been meaning to tell you, I'm so proud of you that you won the nurse of the year contest the prize in Sacramento County, you're really a hero to so many people. Or mom, you look so beautiful in that pretty pink sweater. These compliments lift someone up. How much time do they take? You know, seconds. How much money do they cost? They're free. So, so shower on those authentic compliments. Asking for an opinion. You know, do you think I look okay today or do you think I need to put on a necktie? Okay, and when you ask somebody their opinion, it means you value them. So ask them about your new hairdo or piece of jewelry or well, even more, more, more effectively, maybe you're working with someone in, in adult day center care and the person's a retired Berkeley professor, you know, ask them about their career and say, hey, I only finished two years of college. Is it too late or should I go back to school? Uh, asking for their wisdom. And of course, be positive, smiles, uh, slow down, listen up, offer lots of affirming words. Grace, it's good to be your friend. Thank you for helping me with this project, mom. What would I do without you? These are all, I think, very positive things. And don't ask too many questions. When they, when they um, can't answer a question, I think it causes frustration. You know, mom, uh, this is terrible. I've heard someone say, mom, do you remember my name? Okay, you don't wanna do that with somebody with dementia. You wanna say, mom, it's your son, David, how are you? Because again, they know they still should know. And if you ask too many questions, it causes frustration. I think really damages self-esteem. So again, conversation. Uh, today's world with the internet, I, I love um, exploring personal history and teaching classes. So maybe your mom grew up in San Francisco, okay? Was born and raised in San Francisco. Well, in about 10 minutes on the internet, you can probably organize a whole class and history of San Francisco. You can watch videos of early cable car, cars. You can talk about all, you can have a word game, write down everything you can think of about San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge, sourdough bread, Ghirardelli Square. Have fun and, and do these topics. So I recommend to you, you know, particularly if you have a multi-generational household or you're, you're, in, you're in this work professionally, 
you know, pull out your calendar and do a little learning exercise even once a week. It can be very effective and delightful not only for you, but for the person living with cognitive loss. You know, again, thinking about dementia care, um, I so value these words by Maya Angelou. Uh, Maya didn't write these words about Alzheimer's disease, but she said that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Again, very powerful words, I think, for all of us to take to our heart when it comes to dementia care. Uh, doing things together, you know, uh, we could talk a lot about activities and engagement, but just a few quick ideas for you at home. Uh, music, you know, have an evening concert, play lots of music, enjoy music, you know, listen to opera, classical music, country western, exercise together, t spend time outdoors, doing simple chores. Even with my mother, I used to wrap presents with her. Like I'd say, my secretary is having a birthday, would you help me? And we'd pick out the papers and ribbons. Uh, again, streaming television, positive programs. Screen out the bad stuff, by the way. You don't need to have 24-hour news cycles. That can be very damaging when a person doesn't have the ability to put them in context. Uh, write a little mini memoir together. You know, write a story of your mom's life. It can be very, very powerful. Uh, creating a spring or sub summer project. Visit the ice cream stores around Sacramento, Vicks and Gunther's and all of those. And keep, keep a paper menu, take a picture, do some reviews. All of these things, uh, we have Passover, we have Easter coming, you know, do some decorating, all of that can be very, very effective when it comes to just having fun and being together and doing things together. So as I wind down my talk, again, thank you to my dear friends at ACC for inviting me. I just wanna encourage you, there's so many great resources out there, the Alzheimer's Association here in the Sacramento area, we have the UC Davis Alzheimer's Center. Learn all you can, join others in a support group or webinar. Don't wait and wait and wait to use services. You know, this is a slow process. Dementia is kind of like a slow and lazy river, but you want to get ahead of it. You don't want to have to make decisions in an emergency. So plan ahead and celebrate your successes. And, and again, enjoy the beautiful season of spring and summer that lie ahead. Um, again, thank you very much for letting me kick off this wonderful afternoon. If you want to learn more about my work, uh, you can go to my website at bestfriendsapproach.com. And also on Facebook, you can just type in the words Best Friends Approach. I am there. Uh, again, I'm honored to be a, a volunteer for ACC and delighted to help you kick off the afternoon. And I will be writing a check in a week or two for your big day of giving. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much for being with us today, David. That was such a wonderful talk. And uh, I heard you mention a few things like bingo and music and exercise and writing your life story. And luckily, uh, my program does have a lot of these different classes for you. So if you guys are interested in this, one in particular, bingo size, is bingo and exercise. So I really encourage you guys to check out ACC's website at accsv.org slash online to check out all of the different things here. And again, we're so grateful to have David Truxel here with us today. Um, of course, you can email us and let us know if you have any questions or follow up things for him and we can reach out to him on your behalf. Now, in case you missed the start of the program today, today is ACC's Big Day of Caring, our first ever. And this is an afternoon of talks on different aspects of caregiving. Today is the first of a series of events leading up to our Big Day of Giving telethon. And that is happening on March 4th, I'm sorry, May 4th and May 5th. And to give you more details, I would like to introduce our board chair, Jean Shiamoto. Come on over, Jean. Thank you, Danny. Hello, hi, everybody. I'm Jean Shiamoto. I'm the chair of the AC board of directors. Gonna... I've been the chair since 2020, and this is my second time around. And ACC is just a great, wonderful nonprofit, and it's a nonprofit the services provide that my mother would have used. She passed away in 1988, but she didn't drive. So she would have used rides. She'd be calling Virginia and asking for a ride. Uh, I could see her probably taking classes at ACC. She probably would have even moved into uh, senior living at Greenhaven Terrace and maybe assisted living. So again, ACC services are just uh, so important for, for all of us and for you. And one of the things that Danny talked about was all the uh, programs we have set up for April. So next week, we have the big day of pickleball. We have 32 participants who are going to have a great time on ACC's pickleball courts. And the following week, we have the big day of cooking. 
And we have Billy No of Crew that's going to do a sushi demonstration. We have our own Su Jin Yu going to do a cooking demonstration. And we have David Zuhu coming back and many more. So tune in for that, and you'll probably get a lot of good tips on how to make sushi and all the other things. And then we have next up the following week on uh, April 27th, Wednesday, our ACC golf tournament. It's already sold out, but again, we have a, a, probably over 160 golfers coming out for a great time. And that leads up our big days of giving and as Danny said it's May 4th and May 5th and we have a lot of returning acts coming we have some new acts again and really what I really like about this is our opportunity to showcase our ACC musicians who give great performances and George Connor Asian pair comes back and again you're going to have a great time listening to that so our goal this year is to raise five hundred thousand dollars for the big day of giving and that's a lot but I, we have raised so far $52,000, and we expect and, and more to come in through uh, the next coming weeks and leading up to we're having our telethon, we're going to have a phone bank. So call in and make your donations, and you can go to our website, accsv.org, to make a donation, or you can call our fund development department and make that donation. So your donations make a difference, and it funds our RISE programs, it gives us the ability to expand our online program and put on programs that you have here today. And also we have, or starting a care navigation program. So have seniors navigate through the challenging services and how to, how to understand what medical services are available. We have our senior escort services where we escort seniors safely on walks and they can have a nice chat. And then we also have other programs that we really want to continue, which is also uh, providing PPE for our residents and staff at our facilities, and then fun activities for our residents to keep them engaged so that they can keep doing things, especially like the things that David Toxa talked about. So make a donation to support our operations and sustain our operations, especially during these difficult times, and your donation makes a difference. So please call us and make a donation, and thank you so much for your continued support. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jean. And like she said, we couldn't do any of this without you. Uh, if you could hear some of our seniors talk about some of the things that they benefited from here, they're just so heartwarming and heartfelt and grateful for everything that we do here. And to lead up to that, next on our program are three people who you all might recognize too. They really define the culture of caring here at ACC. And they're going to be talking about ACC's supportive services and also share three remarkable stories of people that they've helped in the recent past. And to set the stage for this, we do want to show you a short video featuring Lauren Peters, one of the drivers for ACC Rides. And I bet some of you have met him if you've used our Rides program here. And uh, he is just one of the sweetest guys if you've ever met him. This was filmed right before the pandemic, so you won't see any masks, but it really does highlight the type of people we rely on. And uh, we rely on them to provide a good experience for people that we serve. And um, our riders really love him and get to know him and all the other drivers. So let's watch it. A lot of them are going to the doctor and I think they just don't have the money to, they can't drive anymore either. They've already had to give up their license or maybe too poor to have a car. Most people are glad to see us. And uh, I had a lady say once, what else do I have to look forward to? I'm excited about you guys coming to pick me up, you know. I feel so happy, you know, they had this transportation to my home because I am handicapped. I can, I'll see you later. I can Thank drive you. it. Okay. She lives deep in the pocket. So uh, she's the last one we'll drop off always, huh? Yes. But it's still a sweet time together. Wonderful. For people like me who don't drive and don't have much of a family here, we need it. <laughs> because I can't uh, walk and I need to uh, get over to Bel Air for my groceries. From 2003 to 2019, the total amount of rides that we provide is 500,289 approximately. We need to get over there and we don't have transportation at our age anymore, so we have to rely on ACC, whatever they could provide for us. Right yeah. Our drivers will notice if somebody's health 
isn't normal, isn't what it use, usually is, and they will contact the family. And the family's grateful for that because maybe somebody who's usually peppy and walking really well one day we go to pick them up, but they're moving slower, they're not as sharp, and you just know that's not how they're supposed to be. It's a cycle of life. Eventually, you, I, are gonna be in that stage. You know, um, let's remember that we don't always all stay young. And one time, lifetime or another, we're gonna become seniors. And we're gonna want to be able to have programs and resources to be able to go and socialize and mingle with other seniors, you know, and not just stay home and deteriorate. Because usually that's, that's, not, that's what happens with a lot of our seniors. They need us without a doubt. And they appreciate us. That's an exciting thing. Most of them tell me they're just so glad to see ACC pull up. <laughs>
and one in every five Americans are providing unpaid care for their loved ones. So it is safe to say that caregivers are us, not them. And most people have caregiving experience at some points in their lives. Also, caregiving is a responsibility that falls on the families across all generations. Baby boomers care for their spouses and their parents in their 90s while coping with their own health issues. Middle-aged caregivers are usually characterized as sandwich generation, raising their children and supporting their aging parents simultaneously. Let's not forget the millennial caregivers who are more likely to take on the role of caregiver with no choice and suffer from financial strain and lack of health coverage due to their difficulty to keep their employment. It is a well-known fact that there are more female caregivers than men. Male caregivers have their unique challenges and difficulties, but I like to point out how women who are traditionally or culturally expected to take caregiving role can suffer long-term consequences. We are talking about our mothers, daughters, and sisters who cannot work toward their retirement and would be in a situation that they would not have resources to care for themselves in their later lives. Our current long-term care system is not working to cover the needs of the caregiving families. Most seniors have their medical costs covered by Medicare, but when they need non-medical care at their home, Medicare does not provide much help aside from limited home health aid for a short period of time. Medi-Cal, which is the California version of Medicaid, provides assistance pay for this care in the community, but can be only accessed when you have very limited income and resources. That is why so much caregiving is carried out by the families and informal caregivers. That unpaid care was valued at $470 billion in 2021, which is bigger than the spending of Medicare and Medicaid for paid caregiving. Wow. So, interesting. yeah, Sujan, I, so what I think I'm hearing from you is that there are many different types of challenges and needs that are facing a growing number of people in our community that really aren't addressed by any formal support system, or at least we can say that there are many holes and gaps in the current system as it stands. Um, our staff here at ACC are working to help caregiving families fill those gaps and, and, and needs through our supportive services. Um, but before we go any further, I think we should also clarify what we mean by supportive services. So when we talk about supportive services, we really mean non-medical care, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I want to point out that often these are these types of supportive services like transportation or caregiver support are overlooked, but arguably they're just as important as medical services because they help people stay healthier and live longer independently in the community. As we heard from David's talk earlier, a lot of people do want to live, um, you know, age in place and live at home. Um, and so with the help of supportive services, they often can prevent having to get medical attention and maybe having to move into a facility. Virginia, I think we talked earlier and, and you had a story about, about a family that was kind of in that situation, right? Yes. It's uh, Gary Fong. Let's watch the video. Gary is one of our clients. Gary and his wife uses our service four times a week. And Judy, his caregiver, is also a multi-caregiver. She cares for her other family members. And as a multi-caregiver, any help you get is really appreciated. You can see that our driver is loading uh, Mr. Fong to the vehicle to go to his treatment. And once he leaves the house, according to Judy, she has time to take her of the other things that she needs to do, not just for Gary, but for the other family members. And oftentimes, she act, doesn't have, she can do anything for herself. Mm -hmm. So being a caregiver, especially a multi-caregiver, takes a toll on her health. 
So services like ACC rides kind of relieve them of the things that she can do while her husband is getting transported. Actually, I can share one of the story that Jean Shimoro shared with us, who is our chair of the board. One, on one of her walks, Judy actually approached her and introduced herself and told her that how ACC Rides has helped her and she called us her lifesaver. We do a lot of work, so it's not just transporting, so the caregiving entails it too. That's an incredible story, Virginia. I think it's wonderful to see how, how Rides was really able to make a difference for the Fong family, but I'm guessing that there are a lot of families in that same kind of circumstance, you know, having to take care of, of multiple people, um, maybe, maybe taking care of a parent and a child, like Sujin talked about the people in the sandwich generation, or maybe you're taking care of two parents, or maybe you're taking care of a parent and a spouse. So what, what are we talking about when we say that there are all these needs? What kind of needs are there? And especially, what are the needs of this aging population right now? Yeah, there are so many unmet needs. Uh, in addition to the health declines, older adults are facing many other difficulties. Uh, for example, economic insecurity. Many seniors that we work with are living on a small fixed income or uh, they have difficulty accessing and utilizing uh, the healthcare services when they need it. And uh, really in a you know, very, you know, the basic uh, sense, they, they cannot sometimes access the uh, basic necessities like food, housing, and transportation. And uh, I also have to mention that the social isolation and the seniors report a lot of times about their loss of purpose in life that can add to the mental health uh, issues uh, the, in later lives as well. Yeah, it's just a, such a broad, wide range of needs. And the other thing is, as we were talking about just the other day, is that it's not just that there's so many different kinds of needs, but also it seems like these needs are seem to be increasing, or at least the demand for services mm -hmm. um, seem to be increasing to help with these needs. What, why do you think that's the case? Yeah, so we all know about the aging trend of our population, uh, not just in the U.S., but all over the world. Uh, more people are living much longer, uh, but not necessarily healthy. Many older adults live with multiple chronic conditions that require ongoing care and support by someone else. Also, the family structure and dynamic is changing in our society as well. Expecting care from your family members is not something that comes quite natural anymore. Yeah. yeah, and in addition to that, I would imagine the pandemic just is kind of exacerbating everything, right? Yes, yes. And a uh, statistic uh, put together by Area Agency on Aging Assessment Needs, transportation is one of the top three needs of the aging population. The first one is the food insecurity and the housing, affordable housing. And yeah, uh, you mentioned pandemic, how it aggravated the, the difficulties of the, you know, the older adults and their caregiving families. I have to mention that many families that I work with, they could not ask, uh, you know, use the services that they could use before the pandemic, like uh, adult day program or the in-home care, you know, the services, because they, just the supply really decreased a lot, but they also, the families had the fear of exposure to the, uh, COVID by using the outside help, you know, the, in their home. And also, uh, they, many of the uh, medical appointments or the procedures were postponed. And it was so difficult for the caregiving families to consult the medical care providers for the issues that they have to deal with every day. And many seniors who had to stay at home, uh, we, you know, don't have to say about the social isolation and how their loneliness were aggravated during the pandemic uh, period. Yeah. And with ACC rights, we have to be creative and innovative with our services during the pandemic. The drivers who used to be on the road has to stay in the office because we don't have too many people to transport. And they're making wellness calls. They check on everyone. And one person said that it's really nice to hear from outside world because they have not heard from someone for a long time. Mm -hmm. And this, you can tell the story if the person lives alone or by themselves 
because when they live alone, the conversation takes longer. And their stance on face masks and vaccination is mostly the topic that they talk about. So Lorraine, Karen, Kong, they speak different language and Jean, and they're able to communicate to these people who are staying at home. That's great, Virginia. And besides the um, besides talking to people over the phone and the wellness calls that they're doing, give us a sense of what it's like or what it's been like. You've been with Rides for how many years now? You you were there from the very beginning, right? Yes, almost twenty years, I would say. So give us a, a little taste of what it's like to to work in Rides and and you know work with the with your staff, but also with the people in the community. I, it's really, I am very fortunate to work with great people, the staff and the volunteers. During the pandemic, all of the volunteers are, has to isolate themselves because of their age range. But the drivers, they modified, we modified our services. We help in transporting meals. We help shopping for actually for the people who does not want to get out of the house. So those are the things that we have done. and. You'll be surprised how much these people appreciate what we do, not just us, but the people that uh, helps them. Like Sujin, she actually had some um, clients who would call us that, oh, is Sujin there? Because they didn't know that we are open. They didn't know that we still provide the services even though it's during the pandemic. Sujin, do you wanna also, you've been with Bridge to Healthy Families for quite a number of years as well. How about sharing some of your experiences? Yeah, sure. So uh, the program that we do to support our family caregivers, it really uh, starts where the caregiving families are. We listen to them and try to understand what their needs are, you know, the, to make their caregiving situation better. Uh, that's what we are trying to really focus. And uh, the clients that I work with, they are the, you know, the really the uh, lifeline for their loved ones. So they already have a lot of strengths, resilience, and uh, you know, love for others and big compassion. So really, be, we build upon to that. But in addition, nobody can do this alone. That's mm -hmm. what we always say. And there are some supportive services out there, but. Caregiving families are uh, just so busy and so stressed about what they have to do every day. They do not necessarily know what is available out there. That's what we are trying to, you know, to make the connection. Uh, that there's a reason that we are called Bridge to Healthy Families. Mm -hmm. We want to be the bridge between the caregiving families in need and the resources and programs that can be helpful for them in the community. So, you know, that we can help the caregiving situation better. And it has been such a rewarding and uh, such, you know, the meaningful experience for me uh, to be part of this wonderful program. And uh, we could expand on our capacity by adding uh, in-home respite through our uh, friendly visitor program when we can uh, recruit and, you know, the uh, help the families to be matched with the volunteers uh, to have some respite, but also the enrichment activities for their loved ones at home. And also we uh, have a lot of educational programs and support group meetings that I facilitate where caregivers can get together because they are experts in their own way. Mm -hmm. They can support each other, they can mentor each other and share uh, what they know about caregiving with others so they can help each other and take better care of, their, of themselves. So yeah, that and is I what like we did. I would like to add to that also, ACC is very special when it comes to caregiving because we are cultural sensitive to their needs. Mm -hmm. We have clients who speak different languages. So most of our drivers have different languages. They speak Cantonese, Mandarin, Spanish, so we can accommodate those needs. Mm -hmm. And it is really, uh, heartwarming to talk to someone as connection that you can speak whatever you would like to tell them and wouldn't have to think that what is this in English what is this in my language so transitioning those things in their brain that's very true yeah I imagine that's such a comfort to be able to just to speak in your native language and I I heard a a, a fun fact from our HR department that did you know that um, I think ACC the staff at ACC speaks over 
32 languages, I think is what I heard. Yeah, I so heard it's that pretty too. amazing. And most staffs and volunteers yes. who speak other languages, they are so willing to help. When we need some uh, language support, we can always reach out and then you know, get their help. So it, is, it has been wonderful. And the, that diversity and cultural sensitivity yes. is something that is very unique about ACC. I yeah. think so too. Yeah. And I also do um, want to just mention here, you know, we've been talking a lot about transportation and and our caregiver support programs because they really are programs I think that interface the most with our family caregivers at ACC. But I wanted to mention that our home and community based programs department also has other programs that many caregivers might find useful and and you know as a resource to them. For example, we have a utilities assistance program and as as you all know the lifelong learning and wellness program that's the um, in person and online classes that are putting on presentations just like this today. And then we have a new pr proposed program called the Care Navigator program that I think Jean mentioned a little earlier. And so the just the kind of services that Sujin was talking about with respect to helping families learn about what their options might be, what resources exist, and how to access them in the broader community. We'd like to be able to provide that same kind of service to, um, to individuals, you know, um, whether or not they're family caregivers, Sujin's program focuses on family caregivers, but we'd really like to be able to increase our social service our, our, and social worker staff so that we can help um, you know, all individuals who might have questions about long-term services and supports. So um, we're hoping to get funding. That's one of the things that we're working on to be able to to launch this program this year. But as we all know, sometimes working for a nonprofit funding can be um, a little tricky, right? Virginia knows a lot about that. <laughs> so um, we hope that you know we can get grant supports, but we can only rely on grants because grants um, change year to year. And so we also really do rely a lot on contributions. And so we hope that people will remember us during the big day of giving as well. Let me share one story. One of my drivers, the very first time I started, he told me, Virginia, why are you working in a nonprofit where you have to look for your salary? <laughs> it was so funny. He told me that. He's one of Chewy's friends, oh, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, well, now I want to put a bit of a human face to all of the stats and you know, information that we've been giving today. We started our program today um, where we met Lauren, right? Lauren Peters on the RIDES video and some of the RIDES clients. So let's turn our attention to some other actual people who are caregivers and care recipients and staff and the staff who work with them here at ACC. And I happen to be sitting here with two of our very experienced staff. So I wanted to start with the two of you. Um, maybe Sujin, maybe you could start and just kind of Give us a sense of, you know, what does it take to do the kind of work that you do? Mm -hmm. uh, many words come to mind, love, compassion, caring for others, but really uh, we are surrounded by people who are living uh, in that kind of a sentiments every day. Uh, so I always say that I learn most from my clients, the people that I can work with through this program because uh, you know, the, we get to share love. Sometimes we cry together, but at the end of the day, uh, these are the people who are there for their loved ones, no matter what, every day, after a good cry even. So that kind of compassion and then we can do something for others. Uh, but also the, my job is to remind them to, you know, they have to care for themselves to care for others, but still that care and that, that willingness to go, you know, the extra mile for their loved ones, that is something that we are looking in the caregiving communities, at families, and the people here in ACC. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> um, Virginia, how, how about you? You know, I would say it takes uh, empathetic, caring and passionate person to do the job what we do in the ACC rides. It is not easy, especially when you come to their house one day, you pick them up and the next day or the next week you come, 
they'll tell you, oh, he's no longer here with us. So mm -hmm. it also takes a toll of the driver. And I remember one of my drivers specifically said, I can't handle this, Virginia. So he moved to another department. Uh, the volunteers are great. I have one volunteer named Dale Yamada. He makes friends with his uh, with the clients that he transports. And he knows who are those who does not have any family member. So during special occasion like Thanksgiving or Christmas, he would come over to their house and bring them food. Now oh, I'm going to cry, OK? And then there is this uh, Wayne Kurahara and this his wife. They, are very, they have so much uh, ideas in their brain. They told me, Virginia, maybe the church can purchase some coupons so we can give it to them, to those who does not drive anymore. But most of the, their congregants still drives. So when those people receive their coupons, they donate it back to ACC Rides and tell them, told us to use this for those who are not able to afford uh, paying for their country or giving their contribution. And Wayne Kurahar's contribution will be forever embedded in our ACC brochures. He helped us create our very first official ACC Rides brochure, the tagline, we can help get you there. That is actually came from him. So that's how the story with our my volunteers with me. I've been with ACC Ride for almost 20 years. I've seen the grandeur days and I've seen all these uh, things that we're experiencing now. We started with one bus, bus that overheats when it comes to 2.30, the bus <laughs> overheats because we use the bus the entire day. It's time to go home. <laughs> I, I know I haven't finished dropping off the clients and it's the bus overheating. So our bus has fan, hand fan, and we have uh, bottled of waters. And most of the time, Chewie was my escort, and he is the one who said, Virginia, I told you, you have to give the vehicle a break, just like us, we need a break too. <laughs> but at the end of the day, we make it, so. And, I, and you have, you also have a story, right? I think we have a video, don't you? You have a story about um, one of your clients, I think, who also just, we was kind of adopted, I guess, by ACC and, and would spend many of his days here, right? Do we, you want to share yes, that story? Yes, yes, yes. Gary Weimer. Gary and his wife used to be connected with ACC a long time and we have drop-in respite program. When Gary's wife passed away, he got sick. He started to living alone. And when he got sick, we lost connection with him. For many, many months and years, I would say, and one time he called us, said, I need a ride. And said, this is the same Gary Weimer, I think, that we know. So we started transporting him and he said, Virginia, could you help me find a place to live? I wanted to live again in my own apartment. When he had that uh, hospitalization, when he came back to his apartment, everything was gone. He cannot go back because he was out for a long time. So after that, we helped him get an apartment. I actually advertised in next door site and people are so generous and he actually called us his second home so he called considered us as family and second home that's a that's a great story virginia um i i hear that we also have an another story and another um video about a special project that we had last year right um, and it's a project for a caregiving family the mcgraths um, and i it was one of my favorite projects from last year because it really was something where it went above and beyond it was a project that involved staff from many departments and community partners um, and volunteers um, but it wasn't nobody got funded for it it wasn't it was you know not part of any regular program it was just something that we did because we could do it and we knew that it would make a difference for this one family and it all started with you Sujin so do you want to just give a, a brief overview of it sure yeah I was the one who kind of mobilized the uh, project but I wouldn't take credit for that so uh, and by the way uh, this was the uh, Project that was, uh, you know, the uh, produced by the uh, under the permission of the family. So, uh, Jean uh, and uh, Catherine, our mother and daughter, uh, I work with both uh, through our caregiver support program. And at that point of caregiving, uh, Jean could not be cared for at home anymore. So, 
it was just uh, you know the shortly after the transition to the uh, memory care facility a daughter Catherine was going over uh, the jeans belongings and found this music uh, manuscript composed by uh, Jean's grandmother and it was the song that was just you know the uh, lying in there uh, with nobody to actually play it. And so that's when I met Catherine. Catherine approached me say, I really want to uh, play this music for my mom and it's gonna be great, great family, uh, you know, the kind of heirloom or the cherished, you know, the position uh, for them. Uh, so that's why we could get help from uh, Ted, our music makers and, you know, the Sacramento County Library. It was a great project to work together, but really to, support uh, the caregiving families in a very unique way. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I'm not sure if we have a video. To, so I think we're going to get to see a part of one of the videos for this project. Hi, hi, hi. It's, it's, so, um, it's so exciting to be a part of the story and Wilhelmina's song. Um, and, and I just wanted to you know, thank you both for letting me be a part of this. And if you will indulge me, um, if we can all imagine, because um, you know how music can transport us, um, uh, if we can imagine this song transporting us back in time uh, to Wilhelmina's house on 37th Street, um, and maybe think about her, me as channeling her uh, through this song. I remember the house well. Yeah, well then this will be easy up peasy. <laughs> running up and down those stairs. Well, and, and we can imagine maybe in the kitchen, you said the radio was there. This could be a song that was played on the radio. Yeah.
really like that song. Well, all thanks to Wilhelmina. <laughs> we have so many interesting and compelling stories just like that to tell. I wish we had more time. Um, but for today, I just I want to thank both of you for being here and for helping us begin to understand what it means to be a family caregiver in this day and age and also what it's like to, to work here at ACC and serve the family caregivers in our community. Caregiving, you know, is often a very tough job with very little formal supports and funding, but that is exactly where ACC um, comes in. We, we can be a support and resource for families to turn to that provides trustworthy services, but cares, I think, kind of like an extended family. Um, so like we saw in our first video with Lauren today, it's a mutual relationship, I think. There's a real exchange um, of compassion and care. Uh, like like Sujin and Virginia said, sometimes loss, but often joy that we have with many of the people in the community. And we're honored to be a part of that relationship. So thanks for having us on today. Okay, thank you so much to Jerry, Sujin, and Virginia for that wonderful discussion. Um, you know, working with them for just a little bit under a year now, they are so warm and thoughtful with all of the decisions that they have decided to make and not only knowledgeable with all of their years of experience, but everything they do, they always think what is the most caring and thoughtful way to go forward and take care of all of the residents, patients that they come across. And so I'm just so grateful to have uh, be a part of this team and looking forward to working with them in the future too. So our next presenter is Scott Okamoto and he is MTV, which is Maple Tree Villages, Community Outreach and Marketing Manager. And he does wear many hats. Uh, so I am just going to go ahead and turn it over to him. So Scott, you can take it away. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to be here today to talk a little bit about an introduction into senior living options, care options, not only within ACC, but just a general view of what the different levels are and different terminology to help you in your start when you're looking for options down the road, options now today, both at home, as well as our residential communities. So to start it off, um, we're going to be navigating and understanding those different levels going through different terms. So a lot of our information comes from the philosophy of senior living is not what it used to be. It's not what we used to know as convalescent living. It's really a place where older adults can live and thrive. And it's really turned its head on a residential option versus just based on simple care. Um, again, I'm Scott Okamoto. I'm Community Outreach and Marketing Manager at ACC Maple Tree Village. Um, I've been in the industry for many years and been able to see many different levels and work within different levels to be able to see and really experience how we can care for our elders in the community. So as we start, we're going to explore what the different options are and the different terminology. A lot of times it's hard to tell what the difference between one level and the next might be. Common terms and residential levels is where we'll start. So the first is at senior apartments. Senior apartments are typically an aged capped community. A lot of us know it as 55 and above communities, but they really start at a independent level. You have your own private apartment. It just is within an age capped community with extra security and safeguards in place for the residents of that community. Sometimes this is also a community that has social engagement opportunities that are self-led by many times the residents themselves. This area is where a lot of times you find the Section 8 or HUD options within senior living. Independent living is the next level up. Independent living is where you have your, again, your own private apartment with some community-based services, such as social classes, opportunities and activities, access to different community-based programs. It's very similar to those um, senior apartments with those added benefits. Care and medical are typically not involved at the independent living level. That is also where it is a non-licensed community unless it's part of a mixed use, such as 
combined with an assisted living or a CCRC, uh, Continuing Care Retirement Community. The next level up from that would be a supportive independent living. That's where you take independent living. You still have your private apartment. You still have options within your private apartment, but you add in some convenient services. So non-care, non-personal care options, such as housekeeping, meal options, as well as transportation, and a social engagement calendar that is programmed and usually facilitated by the community staff. Many times supportive independent living is offered within licensed care communities such as assisted living and they're seen as a zero care plan, meaning that you don't have any hands on physical or ADL activity of daily living care. The next level we would be going into is assisted living. Now assisted living is quite a broad range. Assisted living goes everything from zero care level up to max assist. This is where a lot of residents within the community can either have one, two, three different types of services, all the way up to being either wheelchair bound or having severe mobility. Assisted living is also a place where many of the convenient services are monitored, but they're also included for residents, such as three meals a day, 24 hour um, snacks and access to food as well as 24 hour security within the community with response staff on hand. Memory care is licensed the same as assisted living. The difference is it has a dementia waiver. The programming of memory care is really what makes it different. They offer all the same supportive services as assisted living, just with additional life enrichment, engagement, supervision, as well as a different approach as David Truxell earlier presented on a different approach to those activities of daily living and specialized training for the staff. Typically, you have a higher staffing ratio within memory care, and it features things like a delayed egress door or in the sense of some communities, a locked facility. That means that there is an alarm door. So if residents choose to try and exit seek, it does alert staff to their comings and goings of the community. So that way they can be escorted or redirected by those staff members. Right inside with that is, is boarding care or care home as it's commonly known. Those are typically within a residential retrofitted home where it typically offers the same type of services as assisted living, just in a smaller, more intimate setting, typically around six or six residents, I should say. And the, the staff within those communities wear many different hats. They're typically the cook, the activity, and the care all in one. Many times you'll see two awake staff or one awake staff during the day, and typically one to two at night as well. So it's a smaller, more intimate residential style setting. Short-term rehab is the next level up. That's typically used after a life event or surgery. So things like if you're having a hip replacement or a shoulder surgery, it adds an additional level of medical care uh, for a short, distinct period of time while you're rehabbing, while you're stabilizing, or while you're in transition between one level and the next. That's typically housed within a skilled nursing and comes from a physician's referral or a hospital stay. So those uh, short-term rehab is, isn't something that's usually elected, it's usually something that comes after a life event. Skilled nursing offers many times that short term rehab, but is that next level up where you're looking at having nurse and doctor care 24 seven or access to that care 24 seven. Many times what skilled nursing is able to handle above and beyond other residential levels of care are things like IV treatment, injectable medications, or constant and ongoing physical therapy, occupational therapy, or speech therapy. Many times skilled nursing is also utilized when there is a change of condition while somebody is stabilizing and we're really trying to determine what that next level of care may be, return to home, independent living, assisted living, or memory care. If a resident is not able to return to any of those residential levels, then they may choose to move into custodial care within a skilled nursing. Custodial care is what more long-term residency within that skilled nursing setting with the access to the skilled nursing medical care. So again, the physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy, but also access to physicians and nurses around the clock. 
This also comes into play with very complex medical situations that may involve consistent and constant treatments, uh, injections again, IV treatments, but also comes into play when somebody is not able to make decisions on their own for their own medical care and decisions need to be made regularly. Moving on, we have some in care or in home care options. The first one would be non medical in home care, typically provided by an agency and is an individual that would be coming into a residential setting to provide one on one care for a specific senior non medical private duty aides, as many times they're referred to, are usually from a licensed, bonded, and insured company. So they come in for a set amount of time, either hours within the day, certain days of the week, or all the way up to 24-7. If it's a non-licensed, then of course you always want to look at the liability of bringing a privately hired person into your home. They're usually typically around the range of anywhere from 25, 35 and upward, depending on the skilled level of that in-home care person. Home health is the next uh, term to go over. The home health is typically in reference to a hospital stay or a medical condition change. And home health is also something that typically happens after a skilled nursing stay or short-term rehab. Home health is a visiting nurse. It may be a caseworker. It may be a social worker, or it could be physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy teams that can come into a residential setting, such as a private home, or into an RCFE or other care community, like a boarding care, assisted living, or memory care. Typically, these services are covered by Medicare or Medi-Cal or private insurance, just depending on what your specific coverage is. Respite care is the next term to go over. That is a short term stay within a licensed care community. Respite care can be anywhere from a couple of days all the way up to a full month. Usually it doesn't exceed a month because then you would be seen as a full resident of that community. Respite stays many times are used by family caregivers for coverage of things like vacation or if there needs to be repairs to the home. I know a prime example of a Great use of respite say is when a senior is retrofitting their home using many things like assistive devices or zero grade entrances. So they stay within a community while that construction is happening rather than a standard hotel or family members home. They're usually within a furnished apartment inside of a licensed care community and the cost can vary. It's usually the same price as living in the community with an added additional cost for the short term stay in the furnished apartment. Many times the care is also added on additionally if there is care services to that daily rate. EDL, it's a common word or acronym that is used in care industry and amongst caregivers. ADLs are activities of daily living. Many times these are terms that many people need to know in order to qualify for insurances. Um, also to look at care planning when moving into a care community or even within home when a doctor is asking what types of assistance a resident may need. Common ADLs are things like grooming and hygiene, eating, which is different than meal preparation, dressing, bathing, transferring or mobility assistance, as well as toileting or continence care. Those are some of the most common ADLs, but anytime you're assisting a resident with an activity daily living or something that they need assistance day to day to move on with their life, then that is what would fall under this category. Within care levels, um, or within, excuse me, licensed care communities, they have care levels or a care plan. Most commonly in assisted living, you'll see care levels of zero to four. And we've kind of broke down on the screen here the different levels for you. Level zero is what I was mentioning earlier in that supportive independent living. It would be with any, out without any hands-on care. Level one is light care, so prompting, cueing, setup services, as well as some minimal hands-on assist. Level two typically is minimal hands-on, so offering day-to-day hands-on services for grooming or for ambulation. Level three is typically a moderate or medium care. Four, five, and six, depending on the community that you're looking at, are typically more heavy care. So that's usually incontinence care, bedridden, or even above that part. 
up to hospice care, end of life care. Level six or higher are typically seen as the same type of services that would be offered within a skilled nursing community. An a la carte care service schedule might also be available. That's where each individual care service is itemized. And within that, you look at different severities, things like setup, one person, or two person full assist. A point system can fluctuate month to month where you accu accumulate points as you receive care. And at the end of the month, those care points then tally to a care cost. When's the right time to make a decision to move? As many of the speakers before said, it can never be too early. Planning ahead and making sure that it's not a reactionary or within a crisis event is always the best way to make a transition. It helps a family member settle into that community setting much easier. Paperwork and payment options, there's many different options, so always explore this with the different options you're looking at. RCFE communities will typically utilize many of these different paperwork processes to get the movement started. Within skilled nursing, it's usually done with a medical professional or referral to that skilled nursing. VA aid in attendance is a great option to look at if they might be a veteran or a surviving spouse of a veteran. It can pay up to $20.50 a month for a single veteran or $13.18 for a surviving spouse tax-free. It's like a long-term care insurance policy was purchased for each veteran when they enrolled. There's some qualifying criteria on here as well, and also the eligibility for a VA aid and attendance benefit. As I've always been explained in the industry, it's one of the most underutilized benefits that's available that cost veterans nothing to purchase. Long-term care insurance is also commonly used for uh, care levels. Long-term care insurance, the first thing I always suggest everyone do, get a current copy of your policy, not a copy from the 1980s. You'll look at inflation, any changes that have been made, or alterations to that since the time it was purchased. Then you'll look at a few key items like lifetime coverage or time coverage, dollar amount coverage, and eligibility requirements to activate the policy. Tax benefits, there are a wide range of different tax benefits that may be available when utilizing something like a licensed care community, skilled nursing, or other medical level of care. So always consult your tax advisor as to different tax benefits that you might be able to utilize when either a family caregiver or paying for care yourself. A common question we get asked is what do residents do all day? Life enrichment is key in senior care communities. We offer wide schedules of different activities throughout all of our months and really engage with residents as much as they would like to. Again, you can be as private as you would like to, you can be as social as you would like to, much like a cruise ship. Things are always available. You can pick and choose what your daily itinerary looks like. Same thing goes with food. What is it all like hospital food? No. Within residential care communities, this is an area where it's really changed over the years, even in skilled nursing. Food has really scaled upwards and went to restaurant style dining with real full meals that are well balanced and nutritious. This is an example of one of our current menus from Maple Tree Village. Overall, I wanted to thank you today. Please reach out to any of us within ACC, but my contact information is on your screen right now. Please feel free to reach out with any questions you have about any level of care. We're always happy to help here at ACC, no matter whether it's at one of our residential care communities or services or in the broader community. So thank you again for having me today and please feel free to reach out. And Scott, hang out with me for just a second here, Absolutely. if you wouldn't mind. Um, thank you so much for that talk. I hope that a lot of people can tune into this. And if not, you know, you can watch the recording later on to hear all of this wonderful information that you have. Um, and before I would like to introduce our next speaker, I want to tell, talk to everyone a little bit about ACC's Big Day of Giving Telethon. And you actually were one of the three MCs who did the first telethon in May 2020. And so that was right after the big shutdown of the ACC campus. And so that's when we really decided to go virtual. Um, and I wanted you to maybe give us a little bit of information about what it was like and what we can expect for May 4th and May 5th. Absolutely. So the first telethon we did with ACC's Big Day of Giving, it was a whirlwind to say the least. <laughs> Acts coming on, speakers, it was just a exciting day. 
and it was full of information, but also full of entertainment. So I really highly encourage everybody to tune into our Big Day of Giving presentation. It is just amazing to see how much talent is out there, not only next door in our own community, but also with all the influences we have of family members and professionals that we know worldwide. It's an amazing presentation, and I'm sure this year we've got a great schedule coming up as well. So please make sure to tune in on the 4th and 5th for our televised telecast this year. Yeah, thank you so much, Scott. And, um, you know, I'm finding out a lot of our employees and staff have a ton of different talent, and so I'm excited to see what we have stored. Um, and so now, our next speaker will be talking about downsizing and decluttering. And whenever we run into a workshop on this topic, it's full. I think a lot of people are really interested in learning more information about this. So, Scott, maybe you can tell us a little bit about why, um, and then maybe introduce our next presenter. Absolutely. So decluttering and downsizing is also the first step when looking at care, not only in your home, but also if you're making a transition to a care community. Diane and New Leaf Trans Senior Transitions is a company that really steps in there to help you through that process. They can come into your current home, help you downsize, as David Truxell talked about. Many times clutter, even shadows caused by clutter and furniture, can cause somebody to have a life event like a fall inside of their own home. So downsizing and decluttering really not only helps your overall living environment, it also makes that transition just that much easier into a senior care community when that time comes. So Diane with New Leaf Tra uh, Senior Transitions is going to tell us a little bit about that first step when getting our homes ready to not only downsize and age in place, but also if we do transition to a level of care. Okay, and without further ado, Diane Kidwell, everybody. Thank you. The clicker. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hi everybody, I am Diane Kidwell with New Leaf Senior Transitions, and I wanna thank ACC for having us here today to talk about downsizing and decluttering. Uh, we offer many services with our company. We do move planning. We are uh, what we call senior move managers, so we manage all the different aspects of a move. We can do the sorting and downsizing of your items. We can do the packing and unpacking. We also do the setup on the other end if you would like that to happen. We can do your decluttering for you. We have a very systematic way that we do that. Organizing, when we're putting things away, we're not just unpacking it, we're putting it where it's efficient and safe for you to get again. We do estate cleanouts after somebody has passed away. Uh, the family has gone in, they've taken the things that they want out of it, and then they ask us to go in and do the remainder. Uh, we also, also handle donation and disposal for, the, uh, uh, for a client when we're working on the job. Okay, who can we help? Maybe it's someone that's planning on selling their house um, and their home and needs to be decluttered to allow for repairs or staging. Uh, maybe someone is planning to move into a retirement community, a senior community, independent living, uh, we can help with that. Uh, it's someone that's staying in their home that might, might need to make their space fit more to their current uh, needs or future needs. Oftentimes medical equipment is being brought into the house and we can help navigate how to move things around and get that medical equipment into the house. Uh, maybe it's someone who's already downsized once and it's time to do it again. You've gone from the family home into a smaller home and now you're gonna move into independent living to an apartment or into um, some care. Maybe it's someone who's lived in your home for decades and you've just accumulated a whole lot of treasures and uh, maybe you're, down, you're resistant to downsizing. Uh, we can help with that also. All right, how do we do it? This is an actual client, photos used with permission. Um, what we do is we bring everything out of cabinets, closets, under the bed, wherever you might have things, an attic, we just get it all down and then we sort onto tables or countertops, we group by like items, and then we go through each grouping. How many do you need at the, at the other end of where you're moving to? How many do you want to take? Are you going to keep it? Are you going to sell it? Do you want to donate it? And if so, we can really navigate where that goes so that it can be best used by that group. Is it important? 
Is it something that you need to look at again later? Uh, does it need to be recycled or shred? We can take shredded things, you know, off site. We can have a shredder come to your home. Trash. Oftentimes we have to get a, a dumpster or, you know, we have to have a handyman come and, and take care of the trash. Maybe you're giving it to the family. We can um, put that to the side. Oftentimes we've had to crate things or have things crated and shipped to a family member. Um, we can do all of that. The statistics of clutter, this is always my favorite uh, slide. It's a $154 billion industry, and that is annually. That's a lot of money spent to store stuff. 25% uh, of people that have a two-car garage cannot park their car in it. One in 10 people have a storage unit. That's a lot of storage units. Everywhere I go around the Northern California area, I see more and more storage units being built. And the average number of items that a person has in their home is 300,000. So I recommend that you start counting and you will be surprised how many items you have in your home. This is a before and after. This is a gentleman that we moved from um, uh, one house to the next. It was about the same size home. And this was his before kitchen and his after kitchen. We really narrowed down the items that he had into what he would use. You know, nobody really needs 25 coffee cups that we've collected from all the places that we've been, you know, on our vacations. Because we always use the same one or two coffee cups. So we try to really narrow it down and talk through what is functional and what is being used. This is the before and after of a very active crafter. Um, she had us come in and really organize her crafting space so that it was functional, it was organized, it was labeled. And this really gave her more time to craft because she didn't have to search for things. You know, we tend to replace things, we tend to buy things when we can't find them. So being organized and having things labeled and where they go will save you time and money. This is a before and after, whoopsie, thank you, uh, a before and after of someone that moved to San Diego who had a work space on the bottom and her living space on top. <clears throat> and this is her, her work space on the bottom. We packed her in Roseville, had her move down there, and we got her all settled so that she could work functionally on the bottom and live happily on the top floor. We are part of a, a, an organization called NASM, and it's the National Association of Senior and Specialty Move Managers. And it is all a Northern, a Northern America and up in Canada. And you can Google NASM and you can type in your zip code and up will come a list of the uh, certified NASM members in your zip code area. And that's a great way to find somebody that can help you navigate the decluttering and the downsizing, even if you're not moving. So we have an entire network of resources. Uh, we can refer movers that we work well with, uh, realtors that we recommend, shredding individuals, estate sellers, auction referrals, online auctioneers. That, that has, seems to be a way more people are going is the online auction because you can reach a lot more people. Um, junk haulers and dumpster rentals. We have all of those types of resources in our network of people that we work well with. We are truly up for every challenge, any and every. We've seen it all. You cannot shock us. We, um, we're very professional with the handling of our clients' items. You know, we've done 500 square feet and we've done 16,000 square feet. And um, that says 15, but it was actually 16. Um, it doesn't matter the size of the job, the process is the same. We will just be there a little bit longer, the, the more things that we're handling. But um, it's very systematic, and um, as you can see, it's very organized. We use a great labeling system on our labels, so even if we're not with you when you're trying to find something, you've got a 99% chance that you're gonna find that um, item that you're looking for based on what our label says. Um, we really do love what, what we do. This is a, a portion of our team. We have 12 amazing people that work with New Leaf Senior Transitions. And <clears throat> each of us is different. We are all the same. We are compassionate, helpful. We love working with seniors. Um, we just love what we do for the community that we do it for. 
If you would like some more information, you can go to our uh, website, newleafseniortransitions.com. You can email us at info at newleafsmm.com. And of course, our phone number is 916-761-2539. I do want to let you know that we are doing a decluttering Zoom class on April 18th at 10 in the morning. If you would like more information about that, please email the info email address and we will get that Zoom link to you. It's free and it is to teach you how to do it so that you don't have to hire a service like us. It's a step-by-step -step how to do that process. Uh, before I go to the next slide, I do want to just say how, we, uh, how New Leaf started. And <clears throat> Stacy Zabel is the owner of the company and she helped her grandmother transition from her almost lifelong home into a senior community. And then after she passed, um, Stacy's family asked her to handle the distribution of the estate. And so Stacy did that. And when she was done, her son was like, Mom, you're so good at this, you should do this for a business. So it started out very, very small. And now we are the premier senior move manager in Northern California. We go all over. We've even had clients, you know, have us drive places. They've flown us places because they really attach to our team. And that's who they want. Um, unpacking them and setting them up on the other end. So thank you for having us, ACC, and thank you for listening. And if anyone has any questions, please reach out to us. Thank you so much, Diane, You're for welcome. being here today. Um, this topic is just so important and maybe not really something that everyone thinks about. Right. So I really appreciate you being here today and you. being a resource for ACC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Now, everybody, thank you for sticking with us. And if you're just tuning in, we have a lot more to come. But we are going to be taking a 10 minute break. And during this time, we are going to hear another song from our own George Connor. And then after the break, Jerry Shikuma will be back, our home and community based administrator, and Scott Okamoto, who you just heard from as well. And they're going to be back to introduce Phyllis Hayashi, who specializes in working with seniors who need to sell their homes. We'll also hear from Yesenia Jones, the administrator of ACC Greenhaven Terrace, and Tamara Cario, the administrator for the ACC Care Center. And she will be talking about what it's like being a professional caregiver during the pandemic. And finally, we'll close the program with Julie Interante, who just conducted a four part workshop series for ACC on end of life. And those will be on YouTube if you wanted to check those out. But Julie will talk about how to create meaningful experiences when time is limited. And during the break, if you want to invite your family and friends to tune in, please just send them the link. It's uh, accsv.org slash online. And that's where you can find the link and they can participate today. Now, please welcome back George Connor as we start our 10 minute break. We'll see you soon. Thank you, thank you. Um, so it's um, first of all, an honor and a privilege to have been asked to uh, join in this program here. And I have found a lot of the information actually uh, quite uh, useful and apropos uh, struggling with Getting older myself, I uh, found the the topic of decluttering uh, very uh, enlightening. Um, to give you some context, I have bell bottom pants from back in 1970s, and uh, a bunch of headbands too from the hippie age. Um, being age Asian, I can somewhat justify the headbands, but 30 or 40 of them. Okay, so uh, at any rate, uh, I also want to acknowledge my bandmates from uh, both uh, the guitar ensemble and uh, my collaboration with Mary Nakamura in, in uh, Asian Pear. Uh, I know I'd get a lot of flack if I didn't mention them. So uh, I've been asked to do another song here. This is an old classic called You Don't Know Me, kind of a piano bar classic. So this is You Don't Have Me, or no, You Don't Know Me. Thank you. <laughs> You give your hand to me 
you say hello I can hardly speak My heart is beating so And anyone can tell You think you know me well But you don't know me No, you don't know the one Who dreams of you at night Who longs to kiss your lips Longs to hold you tight To you I'm just a friend That's all I've ever been Cause you don't know me For I've never known The art of making love Though my heart aches with love for you Afraid and shy, I'd let my chance go by The chance you may have loved me too You give your hand to me And then you say goodbye I watch you walk away Beside that lucky guy You'll never ever know The one who loves you so you don't know me Thank you Welcome back, everyone. Before we move on to our presentation, I want to direct your attention to ACC's online programs. Since the pandemic started, we've produced more than 700 live streamed classes, concerts, workshops, and events, such as this one. We have significantly increased engagement with older adults and their family caregivers in the community, many of whom were stuck at home early on. We have an amazing production team, Sean Hidalgo, Ted Fong, Crystal Wu, and volunteers like Matt Fong and others who make the magic happen. So let's give them a big hand. <laughs> Online programming has been a significant but worthwhile investment for ACC. So please consider making a gift or sponsorship for the Big Day of Giving to help us continue and grow this wonderful program. And now, Scott. I heard that our next presenter has known you for like a long time. Is that true? It's very true. I've known Phyllis Hayashi for many, many years, and she has helped residents um, of ours to help sell their homes and transition to um, other homes as well. So our next presenter is Phyllis Hayashi. She's a realtor and senior real estate specialist with Coldwell Banker, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about how to get the home ready and what the process looks like and how it's so important to use a senior real estate specialist when dealing with an older adult who's transitioning out of their home. So we'll welcome on board Phyllis Hayashi. Thank you so much. Um, as Scott mentioned, I, I am a realtor and senior real estate specialist and servicing all areas of Sacramento, Yolo, Placer, and El Dorado counties. I'm proudly associated with uh, Coldwell Banker Realty. I began my uh, real estate career in 2005, and I primarily specialize uh, in residential resale properties. My business is not limited to that, but I, I do, uh, enjoy working with the senior real estate population. How I became associated with um, ACC, uh, Scott mentioned that a little bit, is that he's known me for a very long time. And uh, I first was introduced to Scott <clears throat> when I was um, informed of a new facility opening up in the pocket area. And Scott, 
uh, Okimoto invited me to learn about ACC, learn about the community, and be a part of the ongoing work that occurs through ACC and ACC Maple Tree Village Senior Living. Um, it's, it's just uh, an honor, again, to be able to serve our community. And in fact, just to give you a little tidbit about Scott, uh, my previous work involved uh, working in philanthropy at a local private high school, Jesuit high school. And I met Scott when he was a student there, believe it or not. So this certainly gives you an idea on the length of time that Scott and I have known each other. Uh, it's been wonderful to be able to support ACC through this initial introduction, whether it's through education, sponsoring events, and volunteering, and providing contributions in whatever way possible. I'm, I'm honored to be a part of this, and I truly enjoy being a part of the ACC community. Um, let me see. My laser. I believe we are called to serve others in various ways, and I balance between my professional work and com community involvement in being able to do so. So my purpose here at, uh, to, on this big day of care is to explain a little bit about what is a senior real estate specialist and why work with one. The Senior Real Estate Specialist designation is a national association of real estate uh, realtors uh, credential awarded by the Senior Real Estate Specialist uh, organization. And for a senior real estate to uh, earn their senior real estate credential, they must go through a series of education. And uh, a part of that education is um, understanding information about probate, understanding information about trusts, understanding uh, how to maneuver your way with transactions in the way of managing estates through probate and trusts. So once a senior real estate uh, specialist secures their designation, uh, in senior real estate, uh, they are well on their way in practicing in senior real estate. So why did I decide to specialize in senior real estate? Well, I have to say I am a senior myself, and I believe in giving back to the community, understanding the needs of our seniors and the various options for housing is crucial. And so this is a very important way as to reason as to why I decided to specialize in the senior real estate community. <clears throat> why work with the senior real estate specialist? Well, the senior real estate specialist has many uh, resources to provide to you. And a part of those resources are referrals of various services that are going to help you in preparing your property to sell in today's competitive real estate market. The senior real estate specialist will guide and simplify the process of selling your home every step of the way, and they will help and guide you through lifestyle transitions. It's important to note that uh, assisting clients and specializing in senior real estate is not an ordinary real estate transaction. Uh, it, it requires time and planning and working with many members of a team. There's specific areas to focus on working with seniors in, in our community regarding their real estate needs. In preparing a property to sell, there are many things that a senior real estate specialist must attend to. There's a lot of moving parts in action when selling a home in today's market. It can be oft, often complex and difficult due to physical and limited financial um, 
options in, in preparing a home. <clears throat> so what else can a senior real estate do? A senior real estate strives to keep up with the trends and characteristics of the housing market. They walk you through the living situations with a customized approach, and they provide expertise and understanding with the emotional aspects along the way. <clears throat> we work with family members to assess meeting immediate housing needs and ensuring your property is successfully sold. A senior real estate can help you answer questions, guide and represent you through your real estate needs. So a perfect example of working with a senior real estate specialist, and I kind of give this as a comparison, a senior real estate specialist secures additional training and education to work with our senior community. So as we age, you are not going to be, you're, you're going to seek guidance in uh, seeking additional support uh, to, to attend to various needs of our health in order for you to live a healthy, a healthy lifestyle. So that's why you use a trained specialist in senior real estate to help you through the housing needs and equity of the sale of your property. You're not going to go to a podiatrist if you have a heart condition, correct? So you're going to seek guidance through a cardiologist. Again, another comparison of why you would use someone who specializes in the senior real estate industry. In conclusion, I want to leave you with this thought. Remember, every change and transition is an opportunity, regardless of the stage in life. While I can certainly guide you through your real estate needs, I also consider myself not just a realtor, but I've been told that I can be sometimes a transition advisor. <clears throat> change is difficult, and, it, and as we go through change and as we age, we identify the ways in how it affects us, the ways in how it makes us feel, the ways in how we're able to deal with the change in transitioning from living in a long time family home to transitioning into other options of, of care and, and ways of living. So as a senior real estate, I understand that this can be a stressful time for family as you begin considering your living situations and op options. Serving the needs of my, of my clients requires experience. It requires understanding. It requires compassion, patience, and knowledge. It is not like an ordinary real estate transaction. And I want to give you just a brief example of what I mean by that. Currently, I am working with a transaction where the homeowner passed away and the family is located in Southern California. They flew into Sacramento. I met with them at the property and was able to assess and determine what our next steps would be in getting that property sold. In turn, that left me with having to oversee and be almost like a project manager in getting that property ready to sell. It was scheduling inspections. It was ensuring that the work was done. It was ensuring that all those appointments following were attended to in order to get the property on the market. It took two months to get that property on the market. It's not like meeting a client, meeting a seller, signing a contract, sharing what needs to be done and get the house on the market. Time, patience, and scheduling. So I hope this gives you a little bit of information about what a senior real estate specialist does in helping families, helping seniors in our community in guiding you through the sale of a property and the many facets involved with that. 
I want to share that I, I do have a brochure, a packet of information that I will be leaving with Scott Okimoto to have available for you. So should you wish to learn more, there's uh, several bits of information in here about the role of a senior real estate specialist. So please contact them uh, if you need any services, referral of services. We have a vast array of uh, services that we could recommend, such as contractors, plumbers, painters, you name it, we have it. So I'm always welcome to share those resources with you uh, because let's face it, our homes need continued maintenance. And it, there we're required to utilize, utilize these trusted services that are available to you. So thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, and to share a little bit about senior real estate, be, please feel free to contact me. And uh, my contact information is on screen. Uh, let me know if I can consult or assist you with any real estate needs that you may have at this time. There is no obligation. I want to make that very clear, but I'm happy to meet with you and share my knowledge and expertise. Thank you again. <clears throat> Thank you so Thank you. much, Phyllis. I, you know, I have to, I have to admit that I didn't know before today that there was such a thing as a senior real estate specialist. So I'm learning too, and and that's one of the things I love about working here at ACC is that we're always learning, we're always learning and absolutely. sharing resources. And so we really appreciate you being willing to, you know, share your knowledge and your resources with, with everyone in the community. So. Right. Yes, and there's so much more involved. And, and again, it's trying to share what is involved is, is challenging. So because every case is different. So I, I welcome the opportunity to provide those services and, and even share my knowledge. So well, thank, thank you, you for having me here. Thanks for thank coming you. today. I, I want to let everyone know that we happen to be running ahead of time today. And so we're going to take a little break so that we can get back on schedule. So if you want to go to the restroom or go grab a snack, now's the time to do it. Um, we're going to take a little bit break and we'll be back here at 245. All right. So we'll see everybody back here at 245. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you got your popcorn or maybe your spam musubi or something, and you're all set for the next several presentations that we have. I'm really looking forward to them. Um, I, now I want to introduce Yesenia Jones. She's the administrator of ACC Greenhaven Terrace, which provides assisted living and independent living. She has a lot of experience working with families whose loved ones are moving out of their homes and into long-term care. We only have a few minutes with her, so I wanted her to share with you what they're going through at GT and how she helps family caregivers in particular cope with the transition. So welcome, Yesenia. Come Hi, on Jerry. over. Hi. Thanks so much for having me today. Sure. Thanks for coming. Tell me to start the coming. So the other day, you told us um, that in a way, when individuals move into Greenhaven Terrace, it's not just an individual, but it's really like a whole family moving in. Can you, you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, so it definitely is the whole family that moves in. Um, making the decision to transition to an assisted living or any type of long-term care facility is never easy. These moves are not only emotionally, physically, and mentally challenging for the individual, but also to their families. Providing person-centered care really means spending time getting to know the family system of the residents, its dynamics, and how we work together as a team to establish trust and support to the resident and their loved ones. Most of the common dilemmas that, encounter, that families encounter is feeling that they have left let their loved one down. Most individuals state that they prefer to age in place and not transition to a long-term care facility. When the desire cannot be fulfilled, families feel a sense of guilt and failure. 
Reflective listening, empathy is very important while helping family caregivers navigate these feelings. In order to move forward and welcome the, the next chapter in the family's caregiving journey, it really takes a village. We find that once family caregivers reach a point of acceptance and peace with this new chapter in their loved one's life, it also helps the individual moving to a long-term care facility feel more relaxed and open to the idea. The energy of the entire care team, which includes family, friends, the medical team, and long-term care facility staff, really provides a security blanket for the individual to be open to these changes taking place. At GT, we address adjustment issues should they arrive and check in with the family on how the loved one is doing, adjusting to their new environment. Building trust takes time, but that is the most important job staff at long-term care facilities have. Getting the resident in the door is only the beginning of the journey to the next chapter in their lives. Thank you, Sammy. I can really relate to that. You know, I, I, several of the things you said, like just that you mentioned that feeling of guilt at first, but then maybe after a while when things settle down that you realize that it's actually better, right? Because the family can have less stress. And so when they're interacting together, I know we talked about this a little bit before, yeah. that it changes their interaction, right? It makes yeah. it a little easier in some ways. Definitely. And time is so precious, right? And so we don't know how much time we have left and just making the best out of the time that we have with our loved ones is so important. And I think sometimes with the day-to-day -day tasks, you know, making sure that they have their medication, their food, their basic needs met, we we miss out on the really important times building those memories and spending that quality time together but still i imagine it's a transition right? it is it's like it's an adjustment so how does the role of the family caregiver change once his family member transitions to say assisted living i mean i know everybody is different but can you give some examples of what that was like yeah so it's important for family caregivers to know that their level of caregiving support changes when their loved one moves to a long-term care facility um, but they can still do special things to stay connected and feel mm -hmm. like they're a part of the care team so for example, at GT, we have families that like to continue to do their loved one's laundry, mm -hmm. or some children of the residents that decide that they would rather manage their loved one's medication. And so that's something that maybe they did routinely, you know, every Thursday, they would come over, they would eat dinner and, you know, take care of the meds, and they can still do that, you know, living in a setting like GT. Um, and so for some families, they would rather just leave the care needs to us and spend more time going on walks and going on outings. So the, there is no one size fits all. Everyone's family dynamic is different and everyone's needs are different. And so really it's our job to make sure that we're getting to know the residents, their mm -hmm. families their specific needs and we're catering to those needs to make sure that they have a really positive experience you know for this next chapter in their lives yeah it's i think it's interesting you say that like the, this next chapter in their lives because it's not just that i think uh, people there are differences between individuals or between families but it's also that for an individual things change right and and it might progress to different stages or different chapters of their lives, um, which brings me to my next question, which was, I think our continuum of care is growing stronger here at ACC every year. Um, but can you explain what that concept means? And as we age, what can we expect in terms of changing needs or increasing needs? Yeah, so again, it's not one size fits all, right? So sometimes we even have a family member that comes and is really concerned that their loved one was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. And it's a really difficult thing to process. But we need to remember that that diagnosis does not inform us as what the outcome is going to be like or how long they are going to progress, you know, to a later stage dementia. So it's really slowing down and as hard as that is for us because we're emotionally you know involved yeah. with all of this it's really slowing down and taking 
one day at a time. At GT, we have residents that move into independent living. Some of them are still very active in the community. They're volunteering, they're working, they're driving. And as the years progress, things start to change. Some of these residents are having cognitive challenges, mm -hmm. which is sometimes more difficult to manage when you're living independently. Mm -hmm. And for some residents, it's mobility, you know, being able to do the things that they once were able to do, like their laundry. Um, so we've adapted to these changes, you know, because back in two, around 2008, we took over what is now Greenhaven Terrace. And so there are residents that actually out have been at GT longer than ACC. <laughs> oh, you mean they lived there yes, before it exactly. was independent when it was and assistive living? Glen. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So we are we kind of came into the journey with them, and so we've we've really developed this relationship with them and their families, and helped develop some programs like our, our IL Deluxe program to provide those supportive services for them as they age. And then, of course, it's a real advantage that we have the assisted living, mm -hmm. you know, at GT. But the transition still from independent to assisted living is very, very challenging to process. And so that's what we really try to build that relationship and make it easier for them, you know, to be more open minded to accepting the help, which can be really hard for us to let go of some of that independence. So um, mm -hmm. we have the independent living, the assisted living, then we have ACC Maple Tree Village that offers um, assisted and memory care. Right. And then we have our care center. And so the facilities really try to work as a continuum of care and lifelong learning, of course, that offers the services to those that are still living in their home independently. Mm -hmm. um, so we really try to cater and meet the resident where they are you know, meet the caregiver where they are because the continuum is very long. And we really try to make sure that like if they had surgery, now they need a short stay at a skilled facility. We call each other and we collaborate to make sure mm. that we are accommodating them. So that's the beauty of ACC. And I think that um, as we continue to grow and we continue to strengthen, we wanna be a pillar in the community of what person-centered care really looks like. Can you, um can you explain to folks who are watching and may not be familiar with that term? Because I know that's a term that we hear a lot, you know, in the line of work we do, but maybe people might not really understand what that means. So what do you mean by person-centered care? Yeah, so um, like some of the examples that I provided, we really need to take the time to get to know the residents for who they are as individuals. We need to get to know their likes, their dislikes, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because they're part of our family. And so once we get to know what their needs are, then we can provide them the care the way that they want it. So for example, if I would rather have my coffee at seven o'clock in the morning, but everyone else starts you know, breakfast at eight, then we need to accommodate that resident to have their coffee at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, so there's just little things that we can do, even though, you know, when we think of long term care facilities, we think of institutional settings. But ACC is really working hard to make sure that we are counteracting that, you know, thought and we're really meeting them where they are. And this is a family atmosphere and not an institutional setting. Yeah, and I really like what you said about how so it's person centered and you really take the time to get to know them. And then if things change, even if it's temporary and they have to, like, say, go from independent living to assisted living or maybe even a short term stay at the care center or something, you're able to kind of transfer some of that knowledge, right, that intimate knowledge that you have developed with someone so that when they when their circumstances change, it's not like they're just starting all over again and having to get to know like new staff all over again, because maybe the staff has some information from you all so that they kind of have a head start on getting to know the person which yeah, i think is invaluable exactly that would make me feel and i think yeah it me. and i yeah. was working with the family just today and they were concerned about the care you know services and they're like well i'm not sure i really need this or i and so it's like making them comfortable to say the care plan is ever changing every day we are reassessing you know we don't need to assess on a specific date of the year, 
we're reassessing daily and making sure that there's no changes to the baseline. And maybe right now I'm feeling a little weak and I need some assistance with bathing, but in two weeks I'll be just fine. And so we need to be ready to, to make those changes with them rather than making them feel like they're tied to something specific. Yeah, wow, that's really interesting. Uh, again, I feel like I'm learning so much. So I, I really appreciate that. Thank you, you came. so much for having me. Yeah, I wish you had longer, but maybe it's more to come another time. Yes, right? We'll have most you back. Definitely. So, thank you so much. Thanks, Yesenia. Have a good day. You too. Thanks. We talked a lot about family caregivers, right? But our ACC family also has professional caregivers who are also caregivers in their own homes. Um, they are some of our unsung heroes here at ACC who were on the front lines throughout the pandemic. Tamara Cario, our ACC Care Center Administrator, is here to tell us more about them. Tamara, come on, come on up. Welcome. Thank you. It's so nice to have you here today. Yeah, nice to be here. <laughs> and I know you are also super busy, so we really appreciate you taking the time to Thank be you, with Jerry. us today. Absolutely. Yeah, we, I, I think we just felt like we couldn't do a show about caregiving without also talking about some of our caregivers at, at the care center. I mean, I know that they are professional caregivers, but as I said, some many of them are also caregivers at home, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. The, tell us a little bit about you know your thoughts on that and, and what's been going on at the care center. Yeah, so there is a lot I can share with you. I'm a dual caregiver. And right now, because of the pandemic, I become what we call the tri-caregiving. As most healthcare professionals have dual caregiving roles, which require juggling demands to balance work, caregiving, and other family responsibilities. As a healthcare professionals, we are exposed to, and we care for vulnerable residents, caring for dying, dependent, marginalized, or traumatized residents is particularly very stressful, especially after caring for such residents over a prolonged period of time. Now, I have witnessed firsthand the effects that our staff endures when they closely identify with residents and ultimately absorb the trauma or the suffering of those they help. Now, how can healthcare professionals disengage from the caregiving role and find balance and respite when needed? I have read so many articles that suggest that it is important to maintain or set boundaries to safeguard against compassion fatigue. However, the question remains, is it even possible or even desirable to set and maintain these boundaries? At ACC, we recognize our staff have a great deal in common with family caregivers, both selflessly give up their energy their time to care for others, and also require daily patience, compassion, and resilience. And both put others before themselves. As professionals, we have faced what we have not seen during COVID, which is the staffing challenges, you know, working long hours, and suffering from burnout. I learned quickly the importance of being self-aware, which is a tool for self-endurance. And that was from a personal experience. You see, Jerry, when COVID hit, we became so focused on taking care of our loved ones and the residents that most of us forgot to take care of ourselves. And I'm one of those individuals. But there have been, again, because of ACC and the many tools that we have to be able to do our jobs, working closely with our medical director, Dr. Stringer, he reminded us the importance of self-awareness, something that I even today have to practice because I believe to be a better caregiver, I have to start with myself. Now I have to take care of Tamara before I'm able to take care of my fellow uh, co-worker or even for our residents. So it's a lot, Jerry, that has been going on. I, I, I totally relate to what you're saying. and. 
And I relate to that idea of how you have to really be intentional about it. Correct. Like it's, it doesn't come naturally, I think, for most yeah. people, right? Yeah. Because it, the, the easiest thing to do when you're stressed or you don't have enough time is to maybe cut out something for yourself. That's and you want to make sure that other people are taken care of, yes. right? So uh, what, can you share, like, what are some of the things that you do or that you have either you or, or your staff do to take care of themselves during this time? Yeah, so at the care center, you know, one of the things I've always said, we have the best staff ever <laughs> in Sacramento. And uh, I have learned a lot from the staff there, Jerry. Uh, one of the things I have learned is the importance of taking care of one another. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there are times working long hours, I do have staff, uh, most are here, and they'll say, Tamara, it's time to go home. It's important to have that person who takes care of you and who holds you accountable. Because at times, as I said, as dual caregivers, we forget about the importance of taking care of ourselves. I'll share with you, Jerry, of a staff member who has been with a in ACC for a very long time. You see, this individual was working overtime. And when we got to the point and said, it's important for you to take care of yourself, mm -hmm. he said, you know, I cannot do that. And the reason, because he needed that extra overtime and he needed to accrue his PTO, what oh, we call God. pay time off. So in the, in the end, he could be able to cash out those hours, take that money and be able to send it to the loved ones who reside in a different country. That is what I'm talking about that happens at the care center and it's day in and it's day out. So the financial aspect that caregivers face, inflation has not made that any easier. Yeah. So those are some of the things that we have seen, Jerry. We also had an individual who lost five family members at a car accident, all gone, oh all at the same time. You see, the benefit of working at ACC is the channels are very open to communicate to our COO and even the CEO. We shared the tragic news with them and we asked, how can we support this individual? Are we going to follow the same bereavement requirement of four days? Do we do something different because of the magnitude of the loss? And I'm happy to share with you, Jerry, that ACC met the staff members' need and they were able to grieve well being, by knowing very well that they were supported. And they were coming back to an environment where people were really supporting them. Uh, that's so important right now, mm -hmm. I think, especially. And, you know, I, I guess I wanna say that that is one of the benefits, I think, of working here at ACC is that people really do support each other and I hear, you know, from lots of staff that that's one of the reasons why they they work here is because right. there is that sense of being a family and taking care of ourselves and the people we serve and our, our volunteers. Right. It is Absolutely. it is a strong community. It is. But I mean, you can't also, you know, overlook the importance of the financial aspect, as you were saying, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. and, and especially now, it's, um, it's tough. And that's probably one of the reasons why it has been, I know, really challenging with staffing issues at the care center. Absolutely. And also, we, we have, you know, what we call the sandwich caregivers. Mm -hmm. You know, they are employees, but they are grandparents. And so they do have that caregiving role for their grandchildren. Uh, so we have seen how, and I think with COVID, as, as although it has pressed us, we have seen another aspect of human caring that probably we could not have experienced. And that is tough, really working together, caring for one another. You know, there are times when I would take a few days off and people would ask, is Tamara okay? You know, where is she? <laughs> what is going on with her? Uh, but it's that element of caring that is for everywhere in each and every department. Um, that we are, uh, we continue to see uh, and experience at the care center. So I guess, um, in a way, it's a silver lining, like you say. It is, right? and you have to yeah. find that in every situation. In everything. <laughs> I yes. hear you. Yeah. 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 Well, I, is there any other 
story or last kind of you know inspiration or insight that you might want to leave with us today um there are several stories and and i feel i'm not giving justice to this stuff because there are colossal um stories i can share but at the end of the day we are reminded what maya angelo said people forget what you say to them they will forget what you do to them they'll never forget how you make them how you made them feel and I think that is one of the things that the care center staff strives towards. Um, we just today, just today, uh, received news that one of the staff members lost um, a spouse member um, mm -hmm. who was going through a terminal illness. You know, it's news like this that we receive. And the question at the end of the day is, how do we care for that individual? Even if they're not at the facility at that time, how can we reach them? for them to know that we care for you. Um, so I am very humbled to work at ACC because it is an organization that has a mission and that mission is well reflected on our day-to-day -day, um, caring of their residents and their staff. Yeah, it's, um, boy, there, it, I think it, it, it comes through loud and clear with all of the stories that you shared with us today, you know, just that, that sense of care and community and mm -hmm. and that even um, even though sometimes we forget that at the care center we think of it as as a facility and you know people are there and they're you know they're professional and mm -hmm. all of that but these are folks who who are very professional but also have other responsibilities personal responsibilities at Correct. home and they also have responsibilities to each other because it is the kind of place where where people shore each other up and support each other so I, I imagine that it's a lot for them to handle but um, yes. you guys are doing a great job Thank over you. there i Thank don't you. know if everybody knows but you have actually won an award just recently right as one of the best care Yes. centers um, in the country, a US yes. news report. Um, yeah, and, <laughs> and so that's probably just also a reflection of, of the kind of caring community that's there at, at the care center. Yes, so. we again, we have the best staff, you know, family members are also absolutely have been very supportive and uh, will continue to march on. Um, because of having that support. And that's one thing, as Yesenia had said, is the social context. Once you know you have a support system, you're able to go a little bit further than if you don't have that support. So. Well, thanks for sharing yeah. all of that. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, <laughs> tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Tamara, I don't know if you're going to um, be upset with me that I share that Tamara was actually a little nervous before she came on, but she did so great. And I, I have to say that every time I hear her speak, um, you know, it's just really inspiring. So um, I'm so happy that she was able to be here today. <laughs> well, and now I'd like to introduce Julie Enterante who is an end-of-life educator and the author of the book, The Power of a Broken Open Heart. Julie just held a four-part series on end-of-life topics that we live streamed through ACC's Lifelong Learning and Wellness Program last quarter. She covered subjects that are often difficult to talk, talk about, but you know, so important for all of us to discuss because it is really part of our natural lives, right? The end of life is part of our natural lives. Um, Julie talked about topics such as death and dying, with, or how to talk about death and dying with loved ones, what to expect from hospice, and what the dying process is like, and how life also goes on after death. Today, Julie is going to share her ideas on creating meaningful experiences when time is limited. I've listened to Julie talk about this before and have really taken her words to heart. I can't wait for her to share her thoughts with all of you today. Julie, welcome back to ACC. Hi. Hi, nice to be with you. So, <clears throat> hello and thank you for being here. I, um, 
there might be a little bit of drag here with my voice. If, if my lips aren't right, keeping up with what you're hearing, I apologize. Um, I wasn't actually able to be right there in the studio today. So I am talking to you from my office. <clears throat> so indeed, um, I think that the end of life conversation is extremely important. Um, just so you know a little bit about me, I spent a good 35 years in end of life care, direct patient care, worked with families, I worked with people who were dying, and I learned a great deal from those people. So while today we're going to talk a little bit more about how to keep meaning alive when we know our time is short. I want to start with just telling you a little bit about what I noticed over time with most people that I work with. People who were dying never said, I wish I had made more money. I wish I had worked more. Um, if I heard anything about regret, it was usually about connection with others, that they wished they had spent more time with their children. Sometimes it was, I wish I had traveled more or done more things. But even, even in that expression, really what the issue was, was that they wished they had done it with people they loved. And so what I really came to understand is that almost always when someone was caught off guard by their dying, the fact that um, they may have been sick for a while, but all of a sudden realize that they're failing more and that they're going to die relatively soon. It wasn't usually the fact that they were dying that was the bigger issue. The bigger issue was, I'm not sure I lived as fully as I really wanted to before dying. So I just want to offer that today is kind of a platform to stand on as we have this conversation. Because I really believe that for most of us, we all know that we're going to die as part of the human experience. None of us is going to get out of here without going through the dying process. It's the one thing that we know for absolutely sure that we share that and the birthing process. We got here and we will leave. So I just think that it's important to consider that as I notice that I am not gonna be on the planet as long. Now that could be from aging, it could be from illness, it could be from injury. I don't think it matters how I got here. It matters that I look at my life as a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? Because there's a beginning, middle, and end in everything, including me. So when I realize that my time is shortened, I have a right to decide how I want to live those moments, whether it's weeks or months, sometimes even years, right? Even at 66 years old, I'm thinking about how do I want to experience myself and what kind of legacy do I want to leave? And how do I want to spend whatever remainder of time I have on the planet? So while sometimes I think about, are there things I want to do? 
once in a while I find something that I like maybe someplace I want to visit or maybe I want to learn how to play pickleball before I die or whatever, whatever it might be. The truth is for myself and for most of the people that I work with, it's that I want to have known that I was here and I was fully alive. And really how we know that we're fully alive is that we are very present in our own bodies and in our own lives. So when I think about how to make meaning out of the time that I have left, I think it's important for all of us to look at how do I show up, right? So when I, let's say I'm sitting with my daughter, the question that I then want to ask myself is, how present am I? How available am I in my heart and in my listening and in my language? Because for all of us, especially as we age, we actually have a purpose on the planet and in our cultures and in our families. We happen to live in a, in a not in a family, but in a, we live in a culture that values youth over aging. And so I think it's important for us to look at how that is not serving us. Because those of us who have more life experience and time to see the process of life, um, like those of us who have for many years now noticed that the fields go fallow and then in the spring they grow purple flowers again. We see that over and over and over. And there's a part of us that really begins to trust that in a way that we couldn't trust it and make meaning out of it when we were younger. So I would like to suggest that part of making meaning when we know our time is short is about bringing the wisdom from our own life experience along with the wisdom of our hearts and the wisdom of our souls or our spirits into our families, into our culture, and into our world is very important. One of the things I know from working with people at end of life is one of the biggest struggles is to continue to feel as if they have value and something to offer. I also find this same issue comes up in people as they age. And as people lose physical capacity, it can be easy to think I don't have anything to offer anymore. And I'm here today to say, that is absolutely not true. One of the really beautiful things about having a shortened lifespan is that it provides a perspective. It gives us the opportunity to really see and embrace what is the most important part of our lives. And those are always the experiences of the heart, the experiences of connection. So while there may be things that we want to experience, there may be a trip we want to take, or maybe we want to learn how to sew, 
And I think those have value. And if those are part of what you want to be sure you do before you die, then I say do them, right? Find a way to do it. Learning is a powerful, powerful life experience. So I'm not suggesting that we don't do that. What I am saying though, that as we begin to lose some of our physical ability and flexibility, that we not inadvertently tell ourselves, I'm losing value. Because that diminishment of the physical actually opens up the space to the wisdom, to the compassion, to the deep heart of who we are. And that is what we have of power to bring to life when we know we have shortened time. There's a, there's a lot of wisdom um, in remembering that the external, and I think especially in this culture right now, where a lot of energy is put into um, buying things and having the right things and lots of bubbles and all the ways that we are told that our lives will be enriched if we make it easier for ourselves and more comfortable. While I'm not suggesting that there's anything wrong with comfort, I want to suggest that as we know we have shorter time on the planet, that we not necessarily buy the message that comes from commercialism that says as we age, our biggest focus in life should be on our personal comfort. I actually have experienced with people that I work with that that becomes part of despair at times. It's like my personal comfort isn't enough of a reason to age and or to um, try and create meaning with whatever time I have left. The way life is put together, it's really clear that there are periods of ease and comfort. And then if we're staying present and aware, there are also periods of discomfort and struggle. And I think it's really important for us not to make an enemy of the times that are uncomfortable, or difficult, um, I think it's really important to be able to say this, all of this is the tapestry of my life. Every bit of it is part of what makes me who I am. And every bit of it is part of what becomes the legacy that I leave. I think it's really important for all of us to talk about what it's like to have limited time on the planet with the people that we love. One of the things that I've known about myself for a really long time because of the work that I have done is that I don't want to make an enemy out of my own dying. Because the truth is, is how life is put together. It, it isn't gonna be different than that. And so I want to walk into my dying as consciously and as awake and as present as I can be. And I know that in my shortened lifespan, I also want to keep it open, right? And when I think about the people that I've worked with at the end of life, that's often what causes the most distress 
is because sometimes when people find out that they have a short period of time to live, they start to close down, right? They want to pull in. I don't want anybody to see me having to face this. I don't want to share my tears. I'm afraid I'm going to be judged. So when things get difficult, there's a part of us that wants to close in. And yet I really think that what continues to give us meaning in our lives is to stay open. It's the exact opposite of what we might want to do. I want to share my short lifetime with the people that I love because that wisdom and that experience helps people that I love to become aware of their own humanness and it begins to spark some places in them that says, oh gosh, the day is coming too when I will have to say goodbye when my body gives way. That's a huge gift for us to give to people that we love. It's the one thing that we know for sure that all of us are going to have to work through and walk through and experience. So I think it's important to remember that until I actually take my last breath, I'm alive. And I can use my life and my life force to continue to connect and make meaning, even though I may only have a few weeks or days or even breaths. I remember working with a woman um, this was a long time ago, and she was the matriarch in a family where uh, there was a there were her daughters and her granddaughters and her great granddaughters, and this lineage of women was caring for the eldest, the ancestor, her this woman, and. Um, one of the things that was the most amazing about being able to be part of her dying process is she stayed aware through the entire process of her dying. And there wasn't a day that went by, even though she could no longer get out of her bed, she couldn't walk anymore, she wasn't interested in food, she slept a lot, which is often the case at the end of our lives. But in between, in these little tiny spots in between where she was awake and she had energy, she would ask to see certain of the women who were taking care of her. One of the people in her family that she was the closest to was her great granddaughter. And it was just amazing to watch how she used who she was, all of her life experience, and even her last moments on the day that she died to connect with those that she loved. Here's one of the reasons why I think this is so important for us to really consider is because when we stay connected in our own hearts and to ourselves and to those around us, it makes a difference in how our loved ones will grieve after we die, right? Because they stay here and they live with the loss. And yet the more that any of us can, I, can use our end of life experience and our shortened life experience to help connect and open up a place to share what we're experiencing and inviting others to share what they're experiencing, 
that connection is maintained and even once someone dies, their family is still connected and intact and they carry those experiences with them into their grieving and that matters. And so for me, so often what I talk to people about is this is actually the legacy that we leave. Now, of course, many people also leave other legacies. Sometimes it's financial health. Sometimes a family member will leave a business or there's any number of things that are part of the legacy that we leave. I just want to make sure that in leaving that part of the legacy, we don't forget the rest of it, which is really our common shared experience of life. Well, first of all, of being born, of living our lives, and then of completing our lives, right? Because although we use the word dying, sometimes I wish we didn't, because really truly until I take my last breath, I am alive and I am living. And so really what I'm doing is I am completing my life. We all have a right to own the idea that my life is finishing and I can complete it in a way that is right for me, that keeps me present and connect with my family and loved ones. So I hope this is helpful today. Um, I This is one of my all time favorite topics. And so I'm very happy that um, I was invited to be with you again today and to open this topic up for discussion again. Thank you so much. Um, so much whenever I hear you speak. Um, I, and I wanted to just um, ask you, you know, in case people have follow up questions or they, you know, might want to reach out to you, is there a good way for them to do that? There is a good way to do that. Um, I have a website and it is julie at julieinterante.com. It's right there on the screen. And that phone number 709-0959 is my direct line so you can call that as well um, on my website there is a link for you to email me as well it is also the place where you can find my book called the power of a broken open heart which is basically stories of some of the people I worked with and what I learned from them and what I think we can all learn from them. Thanks, Julie. Thanks so much, Mary. It's lovely to see you. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. I know we miss having you here in person, but yeah. thank you so much for joining us anyway. And um, can't wait to have you back another time. All right. Take good care. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, that's it, folks. Thank, thank you to all the staff and presenters that helped us launch our first ever Big Day of Caring event. Our intent in doing today's show was to recognize the many family caregivers in our ACC community and lift you up a little with some useful information, heartwarming stories, and also just to give you a little break, you know, some time to recharge and connect with other people who understand a little about the, all the inconceivable needs and challenges that you may face. People say you can never truly understand what it's like to be a caregiver until you become one. So often caregivers, I think, are unprepared for their role and overlooked by the larger community that does not offer a system of support that is affordable or accessible for many of us. I hope today you felt seen and heard. I also hope you'll reach out to us and utilize our services 
And if we don't have what you need, we'll do our best to help connect you with others who may be able to help. Thanks for spending your special time with us and being present, as Julie says. We hope you found it meaningful, and we can't wait to connect with you again. Thanks, everyone. Thank mm-hmm. you.